Hi, everybody, and welcome to uh, today's Chaos Scientific Open Source Software Working Group. It's good to have you here. Uh, minutes are in the chat. Please feel free to add yourself if you'd like to the meeting minutes. I don't have a big agenda today because I think one of the things that we left with last time was Dawn was going to provide uh, kind of a, a starter project health metric model to Melissa. Anessa, I don't know if you've had a chance to see that, if Melissa shared that with you at all. Um, no, I okay. I did familiarize myself with the model after the meeting maybe four weeks ago while I was in Australia. It was in the yeah. middle of the night and I was a little <laughs> yeah, no, unsure right. what day of the week it was. <laughs> it um, so, but I, I am familiar with the model. I haven't seen anything uh, that is specific for the, was made specific okay. for this group. So just, I think the conversation, we had been kind of working on that framework, which we can always return to, but I, I think we, at some point, you know, the framework I'm talking about, um, this, this framework, kind of aiming towards metrics that might be useful in the scientific um, context. As we were kind of building out this framework, there was kind of a conversation between <clears throat> Melissa and Anessa that you were bringing forward that maybe we first need to gauge how community members even think about metrics that before we build out a whole framework like let's get a better handle on how some of these metrics might be received within a community uh, I think the there was concerns about metrics being used uh, not in positive ways all the time. And there just might be some apprehension in how metrics are used in, in a number of these communities. And so I, the goal was to have Don and who can't join us today, to have Don and Melissa kind of connect on a few repositories that the starter project health metric model could be run against, you know, and Don would provide a report to Melissa on the results of that, not making that report public, but only sharing it with Melissa. And she would have an opportunity to kind of bring this report forward to key community members and just kind of get a sense of, of how the reception was for this model, you know, and what people's reaction was to it. Um, so I think we might need to, to wait at least from that perspective, uh, just to kind of see see the feedback that Melissa gets uh, from community members on that starter project health metric model. And James, for those for those of you, James Ega, Mary Blessing, Basayo, for those of you who don't know, the starter project health metric model was one that was put together by Don Foster, who has joined from joined the Chaos Project from VMware, and it's really just about four pretty simple metrics, chaos metrics, to kind of just give you a, a starting point to think about the health of the projects that you care about. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go terribly in depth, but it's just a, it's something that she had used often at VMware, just to get a quick pulse of, of the communities that she cared about. Um, and then you could ask kind of deeper questions about that. Um, so maybe we can just wait on that would be my recommendation. Um, and see where Melissa's coming from. Um, my, my other thing that honestly, just for today that I wanted to potentially bring up to this group is this, this is a fairly small group of people. And there's another chaos working group that's really focused at the university level. We could kind of call it academic. And that includes uh, a lot of the Sloan funded OSPOs prior. There's, I know James, you're involved in a more current round of that. Um, but there were kind of a series of open source program offices at universities uh, that were funded prior to the most current round, including like Carnegie Mellon, including UC Santa Cruz, RIT. And so we have a group kind of thinking through uh, open source a bit in the university setting sometimes with very specific units within universities. Um, but also kind of science more broadly, like what are the the open source projects that we care about? So I don't, part of me is like, there seems to be a lot of overlap between maybe what 
we care about here. Anessa, I would imagine that a lot of the people that you work with are in academic settings. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't I don't know. Or I <laughs> doubt it. Down, downstream <laughs> users are in academic settings. I'm just wondering if the con this conversation would benefit from also being part of the other the academic or this university context setting where we could we're, we're kind of talking about a lot of the same things it's not a perfect match um so i'm wondering if we could combine forces so to speak and and bring us together there is another reason for this as well but i'll i'll see what people's first reaction is well, I, I happen to be a strong believer in power of collaboration, and uh, I'm all for uh, joining forces uh, and maybe have uh, a few meetings uh, where we go host. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, cool. So gen generally, yes, <laughs> at least. I, I My concern would be is that there might be a few you know, there could be meetings where uh, we're discussing discussing metrics, for example, in a university context that are focused on, say, tech translation, you know, just kind of the, or, or grant funding, like trying to understand open sources related to grant funding. So some of those might be out of scope for what you would care about. But at the same time, a lot of folks on these calls do care about the communities that are being hosted by faculty members or academic staff. Uh, they care about the, the deployment of open source within their organization, within their academic setting. So there are, I, I think it's that, that latter that would provide some potential overlap. So I'm just saying there might be some conversations that are not <laughs> exactly what you're looking for, but I think others are, are clearly what, what we're talking about here. And to your point about uh, who, is a part of the contributor community. You know, it, it's an interesting uh, dynamic. I would say five years ago, most people who were active contributors to NumPy, I've been working mainly on NumPy, but also like, on, on other foundational libraries, uh, the overwhelming majority were from academia. And I would say in the past, Two years, it was a trend, but I think it's more evident now is that more people transition from academia into industry. And uh, we, I, I work closely, I, I work at Open Teams and Open Source Program Manager, and I work very closely with Quantsight, especially Quantsight Labs. It's a nonprofit branch uh, of Quantsight. So there are lots of uh, collaboration between academic institutions and Quantsight Labs, which is a nonprofit uh, of a corporation, um, a, a part of the corporation. I'm not sure how, um, <clears throat> if it's an independent. I think yeah, it's probably maybe like but, most of a foundation and most yes. of Yes. Yeah. But um, so it's, I would say nowadays it's at least, uh, it's a, it's a healthy mix. I wouldn't say that the yeah. academics are prevalent uh, in the active, amongst the active contributors. Uh, but um, we definitely still care very much about the grant proposals because we've written quite a few joint ones. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are still plenty of contributors who are in academia. So I'm, I'm sure we would find those conversations helpful. So are you thinking to permanently combine the working groups or co-host the meetings? Just co-host for a, for a while and see if there is sufficient overlap between the two and like productive conversations that are useful to everybody. Okay. Yeah. And so the other, the other reason is if you take a look at the minutes, um, sustain I don't know if you're familiar with Sustain. I've been collaborating pretty closely with Abby okay. from, from GitHub, uh, who yep. I think was one of the founders of Sustain. Yep. Um, Richard Litauer, who I, he just got funded by the Sloan Foundation, I believe, to support this new academic projects working group. 
And what he's trying to do is, if you take a look at that link, create a, a map, and I can share my screen here, kind of a, a map of the work that's being done, or an ecosystem map of the, the work that's being done in the academic space with respect to open source. So it's not necessarily, I don't believe that this working group is necessarily intending to produce artifacts other than like say conference presentations or maybe this ecosystem map that I just mentioned. But I think it's mostly just saying, listen, we, we have so many things going on in the academic landscape and that includes scientific software. It includes this recent push around open source program offices. Um, it includes the, say the work that we're doing in chaos around developing metrics to support some of these things. Why don't we try to bring these together so that we're kind of in the same room all the time? Even, were you talking about RISA before I joined? I well, thought. I was, yes, uh, in part, uh, we were talking about the uh, comment that Dan Katz uh, okay. left on Slack about in um, Working Group University channel. Yeah. Uh, and Sean pinned me what I think about scientific out software outside of, of well, science. Um, yeah, it was, it's, a, it's a question from yes. Dan. So yes, there is like definitely some some conversation around whether it's appropriate to call scientific computing scientific. Maybe there would be better word that would not alienate people who are not in research labs, who are not in academia. So right, right. So this like makes honestly this makes my brain hurt sometimes when I hear like university, academic, scientific. Like I don't, I, I have this really hard time kind of unraveling these things sometimes and keeping them separate when they end up kind of collapsing in my brain sometimes. <laughs> I don't know how to how to solve this problem. And uh, that's why I'm suggesting maybe we come together. It's, maybe it's just to help me <laughs> figure out. <laughs> so it's an own, my own personal thing to help myself figure out what's going on here. And some people seem to have this sorted out, but I I, I sure as heck don't. Yeah, I mean, the, the perspective, and I missed the meeting yesterday with the uh, academic, but my, my perspective is that the academic group has been focused a lot inwardly on what does my university have as an interest in open source software. And so it's kind of been from the institutional university's perspective looking out and this this group has been more organized around the what I'll call the science itself and the software that's used to support the science. So it it seem it the discussions have seemed less, you know, more more scientific field focused than they have um, institutionally focused. That's been the difference in the discussions that I've heard so far. And I uh, can I share us do a little screen share on a document that I'm working up. Are you going um, to help, help me understand things? Uh -huh. Well, I can share some <laughs> of my experience in um, putting together the OSPO grant. It's uh, all yours. You should be able to project. Yeah, no, having said that, I now realize I don't actually have it in front of me, so I'm going to take two seconds. But uh, so, yeah, the history of the OSPO here at Texas was, you know, I know, I know Josh a bit. I saw the call. And I started reaching out to people I know who build software across campus, right? So, so I think people are very recognizable to this group, right? So you might you might call them projects. Um, and there was sort of a, a history of that. There was this thing called Scientific Software Days that was hosted here for about uh, six or seven years. And these were all projects of people who had software. And when they gave presentations, they were the sort of presentations that were like, here's my software, here are its features. And then when I got involved in that, sort of in the early 2010s, we tried to shift that a little bit more to tell us about your community and how that works, right? Um, yeah. So a very, very recognizable dynamic, <laughs> right? Halfway through that process, the um, uh, foundation relations and Sloan as a foundation actually go through the UT development office. 
right? So the fundraising arm, as opposed to the VPR, which does like NSF and NIH stuff or OSP. And that sounds like inside baseball, but I actually added a little bit, right? So it turned out that there was another group that was organizing around this call and they were a combination of TAC, so the Texas Advanced Computing Center, uh, and the Office of the Vice President for Research. And their, their perspective was actually more about how the universe, how research computing is happening within the university. And they were super focused on containers, right? And this was a bit of a mind shear for me because I, I kind of was thinking about, you know, supporting projects and they were thinking about how computing happens in labs and how we can make it uh, more, uh, less of a pain in the ass and more movable onto the TAC infrastructure and more possible between generations of researchers that come through the university, right? So there was some experience that I still don't have a total handle on where the university had some major research computing thing, but it somebody left or somebody arrived and it took like six or seven months to get it to get it working again. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, oh yeah. Seen that. Yeah. So this was a really interesting juncture for me, right? And one is the Ospos kind of facing their own computing inside the organization. But also calling that open source because it's using a lot of open source. And doing it effectively depends on effectively interacting with open source components, um, which, and you know, and the others are people producing open source components and publishing them, right? So our OSPO um, eventually came to organize around what we call this thing, uh, what we call a pathway to participation, which basically says, hey, there are people out there doing computing. Step one is to get them aware that they're using open source components. Step two is to get them actively interacting with the communities. So asking good questions, uh, maybe even answer, helping to answer questions about using the tools within their lab, right? And doing this locally, but also increasingly doing this in the projects in public. And, you know, the second step, and this is the diagram I can't find, but um, is to have them um, have them contri potentially contributing to projects, right? And also for the projects that are launched within the university, uh, you know, getting potentially getting contributions from outside. So the exact sort of <laughs> metrics that we were just looking at in the project starter metrics, right? Uh, and then the higher level of participation is starting to think about um, ecosystems right and upstream and downstream uh you know pushing work to the right to the right location so we were able to sort of make this group make these groups understand each other a little better by thinking about uh you know all these people who are doing research computing inside the university how does their work eventually contribute to the sustainability of the components that they're building on um so I think I think that maybe gives you a little bit of what that overlap looks like between the two groups. So can I kind of repeat what I heard you say? Please. <laughs> so a couple things that you were trying to do is is raise internal awareness within UT computing centers or just UT broadly about who is using open source or the fact that you might be using open source. Just understand that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the two things that kind of come from that is potentially connecting with the upstream community, <clears throat> I'm mm -hmm. guessing, to understand how the community functions, maybe the health of that community, just because you're dependent on this community. Is that right? Um, yes. So it's making the link between our research would be more effective mm -hmm. if we better interacted with the open source sure. communities. Gotcha. Okay. Now it's it's probably neither necessary nor sufficient, 
but it's probably helpful. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. And then potentially contribute to the upstream for kind of obvious technical reasons that are kind of like classic open source things, I'm guessing. Right. Here, I found I found the thing. Yeah. So instead of fixing it every time there's a release, just go ahead and contribute to the upstream. Okay. Yeah. So this is what we were calling our pathway to participation. So is that zooming for you? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is this is sort of like built on a capability <laughs> maturity model. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping to publish this on the OC blog. Right. So you know, step step one is researchers using the appropriate tools. So that's a little bit of like discovery. And step two is contributing by kind of active participation in open source communities. Um, step three is actually, you know, making code available. And so a lot of projects that are funded in the universities are already here. Sure. Right. And then step four, I think, is more classic open source things uh, of actually accepting contributions and advancing them. So really what I think is being added is, is this element here, but from a, from a university as a place where activity happens. Yep. And it's interesting because the actual, the using the discovery phase is something we actually talked about in the university working group. Like how do you yep. go about even discovering in the first place? Yep. Which is super, super challenging in and among itself. Right. And then the other thing is that this, like, I think that there's a real question as to the extent that people like students or even postdocs are empowered to talk about their research project in public. And so that, um, that then means it can be really hard for them to actually interact with the software communities in public. Um, and so one of the things that uh, I just did a bunch of interviews with the, the Australian research community, um, this is along with Karthik Ram, and one thing that came up was people are willing to ask questions, like help me questions within their labs, but they're not willing to ask them in public forums. And that was like a real surprise to some people, but the researchers were pretty clear about that. They're like, it's a pain. I don't want to be public with, with my incompetence, right? I don't know if my PI would like me to be talking about the work in public. And so one of the things that came up was, was the role of groups like Hacky Hour, um, which are like local communities of practice within a university where people feel a little bit, you know, they're neither private to the lab, nor are they public to the world. And the importance of that as socialization into potentially having publicly visible yep. things that the projects could even see. I, I agree with that. This is honestly a bit of a side, but well, no, keep that up for a second. Oh, sorry. Um, in the corporate space, they as they push developers to work in the public, the, the 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 one I've heard that I love is they're trying to encourage their contributor or their encourage encourage their um, employees to to kind of balance between boredom and fear, which is the boredom of just working internally and the fear of working in public. Yeah, in public. And so yeah, breaking that like right balance that. is challenging. Um, and so then, so the first two I kind of see as um gaining an understanding of what is happening in this case at the University of Texas and thinking about how we can kind of make those contributions back to the projects that we care about that we're, that we're relying on a little bit the latter two or three and four seem to me about perhaps say external funding that has come in that includes the development of a software tool and thinking about how to get that out in into a public space and the complexities that go along with that, kind of like what you were talking about, the work you were doing in 2010. Right. It just kind of putting it out there and thinking about community development. Um, and so three and four kind of fit in that world for me. And then advancing ecosystems is, that's a, to me, a bit of a higher level form of thinking because you're, you're really looking across a, a collection of software and trying to understand 
um, where there are weaknesses potentially beyond just the projects that I share or the single pro the kind of the one aways the one away that I share or the one away that I that I consume um, and thinking about ecosystems and we've talked about this like with Vanessa and Melissa that a lot of the projects they work with are like at the top <laughs> of the upstream they're they're very very high and sometimes not completely visible internal to the organization just because they're so high up <laughs> in the upstream um and so that's kind of the ecosystem world is what I see there. Like, yep. okay. So um, Anessa, I'm kind of curious as to what your reaction to this is too, because I think what James is sharing here is, is a lot of the conversation we hear in the, the this other working group that we have, this academic OSPO, you know, academic university working group that a lot of people are kind of working through the complexities that sit at, within using, contributing, sharing, accepting, mentoring, educating, whatever it might be. And so does this does this speak to you in any way as to how the work that you're doing could potentially benefit from this? Absolutely. I, okay. I it it's it aligns very well with the conversations that we have internally, especially during our uh, work on the CCI EOSS grant. Um, James, just a quick comment. If mm. you ever part of the conversation where somebody affiliated with your institutions is struggling but is afraid to post something on, on GitHub because then everyone might read it. Huh. I think everyone who's, who is working open source was once uh, of, of this like, dilemma, like should yeah. I, should I not? Um, we we do recognize it, and we we implemented the uh, in the four projects that we were funded to work on, and also uh, establishing it as a practice in the SciPy community, holding newcomers hours. And um, most projects have community meetings, but those still can be uh, pretty intimidating to ask questions. And depending on the size of the project, like Jupiter has pretty um, a pretty good crowd at their community meetings, like 30 plus people. Um, so newcomers hours, um, NumPy, Matplotlib, Pandas, um, SciPy, all host newcomers hours. And that's where you get this uh, sometimes one-on-one -on -one with maintainers to ask questions. Yeah. Also, uh, some Thanks. communities yeah. have Slack uh, and dedicated channels. I mean, those are more visible, but we we recognize that there is a need for a safe, safe place to to discuss your technical struggles and maybe understanding of software as a user. Yes. Yeah. No, that makes a ton of sense. And of course, the Slack channels. Yeah, they're sort of public, but they're not also arc. They tend not to be archived. Um, Although like Gitter ones often are, but uh, but Slack channels often aren't. So I think those those interstitial, those in between spaces are really valuable. So definitely send people that that direction. Something that I've been struggling to to address while working on this grant, and I think there is. A, you know, some things you can achieve uh, with the power of volunteerism, <laughs> but I think the, the, the more funding available to open source projects, the, the harder it is to address, you know, to, to recruit volunteers for certain tasks. I'll be honest about it. And um, something that I find uh, a challenge and it was true before even funding was available and i think it's even harder now transfer of knowledge meaning having maintainers time to to mentor newcomers potential maintainers um, i think we had the conversation with sean and mm -hmm. matt a while ago as part of this group is that if as a maintainer you have very limited especially volunteer maintainer um, you have things that need to be done now and then there are things that are 
potentially good for the project, but not guaranteed. Like if you fix bugs, if you uh, cut a new release, uh, th that's that goes into the category done, where if you spend hours on mentoring somebody, especially if that somebody is also a volunteer, uh, th there is no guarantee that this person will stay with Pay the project. In the, and in the long run, yeah. Um, so I was wondering, <laughs> one, one idea I was entertaining, applying with foundations who care about open source sustainability to fund mentorship programs where mentors are paid is there are some pro mentorship programs where mentees are paid but mentors time is not rewarded um, and also i think to make it more sustainable not depend well to make it more sustainable uh, maybe this could be a new uh, new field new um, to pursue it for academic institutions is you know we academic institutions are good at transferring knowledge uh, and it could be that the, there would be people paid to transfer knowledge when it comes to maintaining software it's, it's a very nascent it's you know this idea is at a very nascent stage and i i you know, I, I don't work in an academic institution and I don't know all the ins and outs, but I'm just, this is something that I think would be very beneficial for, for students, also for open source, for open science, maybe even more beneficial than having more research papers published. I what? Do. Not less papers? It's I an know. outrage. I do yeah, think no. some of this is trying to be addressed with these open source program offices, maybe not to the extent that you're talking about Anessa, but just it's trying to support these types of processes that may exist in, within a university already at these very early stages and trying to accelerate them a little bit. So I think we've just had no visibility into this at all in the university setting, none. <laughs> When I say none, I mean like none. Yeah, it doesn't come to that conversation. No, and so I think a lot of the work that Sloan is doing in supporting the university open source program offices is not, I don't think it's quite the same as say corporate open source program offices. I think it's it's more meant to identify what's occurring in a university, try to accelerate what's already there, and then be supportive of changes in the university um, as needed around open source. So that's kind of my take. I, it's, yeah. been, it's been interesting feeling the differences between corporate and university open source program offices. I thought they would overlap a lot and they don't at all. Well, not at all, but a little bit. <laughs> I mean, what I'm hearing from you there, Inessa, is, is that universities are particular types of institutions that are you know, long lived, that are interested in passing, you know, passing on knowledge, and are interested in, uh, like, social, social or infrastructural impacts that plug the gaps of the world, right, in a way, and um, that maintenance and sustaining software as a knowledge base, so knowledge about how to do this sort of work, but also the artifacts themselves as a base for knowledge is a, uh, ought to be part of the institutional mission of universities. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I think that there are hooks that we can connect to within universities to make that case, you know, more, more strongly. Right. And I think the libraries are a really important place to start that. Um, they tend to have a, an overview that goes beyond the disciplines. Um, and so I think I think that'll be really important. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, it also made me think of uh, the Invest in Open project. I don't know how much you're familiar with that, but uh, it's very much in the same in the same space. 
that's Caitlin, Caitlin Thaney is the executive director there. I now that I'm looking at the website, I think I I heard of them, but I never really looked into their work. Yeah, I'll, I'll do so, it now. So my my feeling is that they are positioned to basically help inst help <laughs> help well positioned to help universities contribute and view the maintenance of open knowledge infrastructures as part of their job, um, in, a, in a really practical way. So that that's another organizational configuration. Ooh, Thank you right. for pointing me in the right yeah, direction. Yeah, no, I'm really excited to, to point point people to these uh, newcomer hours and things as well. And, and that's something like our librarians on this OSPO are going to be like working towards, um, which is like how to get people more involved in communities that can help them. And those sorts of things are really key. What is this site, James? What do they do? Invest they... in open. Yeah. Um, so as I understand it, do you do you know Caitlin? Caitlin think maybe okay. I don't not, mm. not right off the top of okay. my head. So um Basically, universities spend a lot of money on technology infrastructures. Most of that money goes to proprietary platforms instead of uh, contributing to okay. a non-proprietary yep. uh, infrastructure. Sure. How can we harvest some of that budgetary power yep. to maintain knowledge infrastructure stuff for the long term? Yep. Gotcha. So it it is a little, um, it comes from a slightly different angle, right? So uh, I think that. But is the premise, instead of spending a million dollars under a software office, license, buy yeah. software, work with consulting company, think about that million dollars as a way to use open source and sustain the communities that you rely on? Is it? Yes, I think that that is a, a good high level. Um, okay. Caitlin's a bit involved in the sort of effective altruism uh, or like effective, uh, you know, giving movements. Mm -hmm. So she's thinking from that perspective as well. Okay. That list might give you an idea of the sorts of infrastructure that they're looking at. Okay. Um, okay. She's also she also came through the like nature publishing ringer um mm -hmm. with like the okay profit versus open publishing world yep okay no that's interesting thanks for sharing that so if if we were to move this meeting into the university or the what we'll call academic working group meeting it anessa and james and mary blessing and yiga and sean basayo that meeting is um, on yes. Wednesdays mm -hmm. at, yeah. at the okay. same time. Is it 11 or this time? It's 11 a.m. <clears throat> U.S. Central. Central. So it's an hour later. So it's on Wednesdays an hour later. We would just have a much bigger group of people that are talking <laughs> about all of this stuff. Does that work for you, Vanessa? You're muted. I think you're mute, muted, Vanessa. It's not obviously impossible for me. Okay. <laughs> it, it, um, is, it, it is. It isn't. It is not. Okay. It's not, not obviously, obviously impossible. impossible. I like had to construct that. Uh, yeah, I really had that. to work that through my brain. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a meeting on Wednesday made me smile. It seems like everyone in the universe wants to have a community meeting on Wednesday or Thursday, Wonderful. but <laughs> am I the only one? <laughs> At we, least do, in my we, universe. Do, we do have a lot. I, do, I agree. Yeah. Um, it happened to be that that particular hour, I am free, so it would work. Okay. And it's, it's every two weeks, just like this one, you know, so the next one would be 13 days from now and then so on and so forth. So, okay. 
Why don't we plan on that? I'll still leave this this one on the calendar. Just I want to make sure that Melissa can also make it because she's been such an important part of this conversation. Um, but I just I, I think you'd really enjoy that group of people. Um, James, that's a lot of the other open source folks, or I'm sorry, the Osbo folks. Yeah. Yeah, no, that'll be good. I'll, I'll get one well. of our uh, librarian people to also start to attend. That. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Saeed, you, you know Saeed from Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. Yeah. Super active in that group and just okay. really helpful. And the folks from UC Santa Cruz, likewise, and open our IT. So it's a good group of people. So I, I think that would be a great place to kind of carry on these conversations. So very blessing. Awesome. I'm glad that works for you as well. Okay. Um, well, with that, I'll send a note out to the Slack channel just to, as a reminder for folks, but temporarily we'll just merge these two and have this conversation on the, on the very crowded Wednesday afternoons or <laughs> Wednesdays uh, for people. All right. All right. Sounds good. Right on. Cool. Uh, and then we're looking forward to hearing from people in academic open source projects about the metrics. Yes. Who's driving that? Is is Melissa driving that? So in terms of the the other meeting? No, no, sorry. That you showed us a some slides with starter metrics. Oh, yeah. So basically what that was was um so, so as we were kind of building out the framework, like what metrics would scientific software communities care about? Like we we're trying to build out kind of a series of metrics there, but we were told maybe the first the first step is let's just see what these communities' response is to metrics, right? And so Don had provided the responses, and Melissa was going to take it to her group and then come back, and she'll she'd either say they hated it or it was well received, or here were the okay. points. Great. Right? No, that's super interesting. Yeah. So we're trying to, and without just making it public for everybody, we're kind of doing it. <laughs> so Melissa can just provide that feedback. And so if Melissa can make it, I think that'd be a great conversation to have, you know, in, in two weeks or next meeting out or something like that. Yeah. So this is um, the non-focus summit. Uh, this will be the ground for testing out this metrics and continue the conversation. Yep. Um, how we can collect uh, metrics and what metrics we can collect to, to make everyone comfortable because our previous attempts like, kind of got stuck at the point that metrics, we don't want any metrics. Yes, so we're, we're trying to unstick <laughs> that a little bit. <laughs> and yes. so... <laughs> so it's a, it's a it's still a scientific Python community, it's a slightly larger crowd. And uh, I, I, I am one of the organizers of, of the summit, and uh, I saw a lot of uh, suggestions uh, related to this topic uh, for the programming of the summit. So we'll have a breakout session on community health metrics. Perfect. When is that? Um, so the summit starts on, the, on Monday, on the 11th of September. Okay. Well, it'd be great if you can kind of give us an update on how that went. I I can do it at the next meeting or before that. The next meeting would be great in like 13 days. Okay, awesome. All right. It's really good to see everybody. Yeah, good to see y'all. And have a great end of the week. We're actually close. <laughs> Seems that way. Finish line. <laughs> <clears throat> all right, everybody. Take care. Right. Take care, all. Bye. Bye, y'all. Bye.